Hello and good afternoon and welcome to this Jam Lab Meetup, a four-part Jam Cafe monthly event series brought to you by the Civic Tech Innovation Network and Jam Lab. My name is Tapo Chabalala and I head up the Jam Lab program here at Vits Journalism. Uh, and joining me today is Dr. Nkiru Baloni, founder of the Africa Soft Power Project. We have Nanjala Nyambola, writer, advocate and traveler. And we also have Daniel Orubo, editor-in-chief at Zigoko. So before I jump into today's topic of discussion, I want to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, in the words of our head of department here at journalism, Professor Franz Kruger, he always says, please tweet and tweet often using the hashtag JamLab Meetup. I really want to make this a discussion and would like you to please use the Q&A function for any questions directed at speakers or, and for all the comments and queries, please leave those in the um, comments section or the chat function uh, that is to your right. So just so you're aware, this JamLab Meetup is being recorded and will be publicly available on various digital platforms in different formats. So uh, today's topic, reclaiming African narratives through storytelling, making it happen. It's the second of the two part conversations we're having. And we had the first one a couple of weeks ago, unpacking what needs to be considered in reclaiming African narratives through storytelling. And the two key takeaways from that session were one, that we need to make sure that we are putting out our African stories across the continent. And secondly, that we as in Africans in Africa and those in the diaspora have to be consuming our own content. And that brings us to today's conversation. And we've called in some of the doers to share their experiences and learnings in actually what is working um, on these issues. We are looking for their practical insights, uh, the observations as African narrative builders. And during this conversation, we will interrogate their models and also innovations. So firstly, I wanna begin with Nkiru. How is the Africa Soft Power Project playing its part in relation to the topic of discussion for today? Okay, thank you, Tapo. This is um, it's very, I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I also very, you know, big congratulations for the Jam Lab Meetup and the Civic Tech Innovation Network. The work that you guys are doing is incredible. And I also want to, very quickly to say uh, um, I'm super, super pleased to be um, joining Daniel Orubu, who is doing great work at the Coco, as well as Nanjala Nyabola, who is like an amazing, I, I mean, we're inspired by her work. Uh, just very quickly, I, I prepped some notes for about the Africa Soft Power Project, just to quickly go through my notes. Um, I feel like there's no contest that the world is largely driven by storytelling and narratives. I, if you think about it, our perception of nations, of regions, of cultures are rooted in the stories we are told. Like every power play, every movement, ideology is defined by stories think about it again, narratives are the bedrock of perception and perception drives action. Uh, I always like to think, sort of like narrow it down to my life and, 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 and people around me thinking about growing up. I grew up in Nigeria and many of us grew up around American music and movies. I think growing up in everybody I know had some sort of American accent or American thing going up, you know, we're like, oh, we want to go there, want to this, want to, want to, want to, right? So think about Hollywood and now Netflix to brands like Apple and Nike, to Oprah, Beyonce, Kobe, the Obamas, um, now Biden and Kamala. America continues to, you know, shine out this beacon of hope to many of us. And I, I think that's precisely because of its diversity and soft power. Uh, 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 and even though we know that the country faces many issues, um, we now know anyway, we didn't know before because we just thought from all the movies that America was the land of, you know, everything hopeful. Uh, we called it or they called it that we, dream, we all had the American dream growing up. And we're just as proud of people like Trevor Noah as we are of Burner Boy who've gone to America and sort of like, you know, shone us bright. I don't know if we can claim um, Tesla. I, I, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit, but again, you know, Elon being like South African born is again that whole like, oh, this is African is doing great. But on a serious note, think about it. The news about Africa is markedly different from this little drops of, you know, African, you know, amazingness that we see. The global media, and I think even our media 
likes to amplify the challenges that face the continent. If we look at the TV, everything in Africa is always about hunger, hunger. You know, we have flies, kids with flies, women carrying 50 things on their back, all of that. And so it's really like that we as a people and we as individuals and we as Africans have to challenge the, the, negative, the negative stereotypes and build a better picture. I think I personally believe it's about harnessing our individual soft power um, as, as individuals and as collectives. And I, because this is a, a school sort of webinar, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about my doctoral thesis, which was on um, film as a catalyst for socioeconomic development, which is actually where I came across the idea of soft power, which was a, a, um, a, a term that was um, coined by a Harvard professor, um, Joseph Nye, describing it as the ability to attract and persuade arising from the attractiveness, a nation's attractiveness, um, its culture, political ideals and policies. I've taken the liberty of shifting the onus a little bit from nations uh, and to us as individuals and by extension, the private sector. I think you can imagine why. I mean, generally leadership on the continent hasn't been as um, as impactful as it, it could have been or it can be. So I think as a matter of urgency that we as, you know, individuals, we, we as um, individual Africans, we as a private sector need to portray Africa differently. We need to communicate Africa's achievements. We need to inspire particularly the next generation of young Afri Africans, not only the ones on the continent, but also around the world. And we have, you know, the internet as a resource to use and do that. And the only way we can do that is actually to optimize our own stories, whether as you know, individuals doing amazing things or as collectives doing amazing things. I think it's really, really important. And that's actually what led to the Africa Soul Power Project, um, us starting it, because we're really passionate about using you know, our soft power to transform the trajectory of the continent. And also in particular to include African voices in, in global discourse. I think generally when you look at conversations, even the conversations about Africa that concerns Africans, there are usually no Africans in the room. So the project Africa so far is particularly designed to amplify expressions of African success while simultaneously trying to deactivate traditional stereotypes. Uh, and I think it's important for us that we're, you know, we're, we're narrowing down on creative and cultural um, industries because we think that they're the fastest vehicle to change perception about the continent. It's also a very quick vehicle to be able to build bridges between Africa and the global black community and of course the wider world. So in summary, uh, um, this is just a quick uh, um, overview of Africa South Power Project. I think generally uh, um, we all have different things in life that we're good at and we're, you know, um, we all want to do different things. But within these spaces, our lives and our work can inspire and help to transform the continent. Um, growing up, my mom would always say that if we all swept the front of our own homes, if we all at least at the minimum, you know, um, swept our home, uh, the, front, the front of the yard, as she would say, at the very minimum, if we all did that, we would have a clean street. So I don't know you know, how, how far we can get as individuals. But I do know that if we actually all sort of like aspired to do our best and we all sort of like deliver at the highest standards, we can create new stories and narratives of the continent, regardless of, you know, what our different governments are doing. That's it in short. Thanks, Kiru. And, and you, you got me thinking, um, the name uh, Africa Soft Power Project is very deliberate. Um, tell me how important it, how important soft power is in changing narratives and why that name? I think soft power was the, the name, as I said in my, um, in, in, in my, I think, speech, my notes that I was just delivering earlier, is that soft power, I didn't come up with it. It was a, a Harvard professor who came up with it. Uh, um, and I was do, when I was doing my research on film, it was like, it was a new idea for me, a, a new idea in terms of seeing it crystallized. But you know, something you've been thinking about, like, oh, this is in the back of my mind, we could actually do different. So that's why we picked the name soft power because it's compared to hard power, compared to government, you know, thinking about military power and all of that stuff. But soft power, the ability to sort of change people's minds by, co you know, by uh, um, persuading them, by attracting them to what you're doing, 
as opposed to coercing them. So that's why the soft power thing, that's why we came up with the name Africa soft power. We don't think that Africa has done enough to harness its soft power, whether from the creative sector, whether in terms of leadership, whether in terms of private sector, we think that Africa can do better. Africans and the continent in general can actually do better. Thanks, Ikiru. I want to quickly move to Daniel. Um, but before I'm moving on to Daniel, I want to remind everybody if you've just joined us, we're having a conversation on reclaiming African narratives. And we have some of the doers uh, in the room from the continent to tell us how do we make it happen, you know? Um, as consumers of, 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 of stories, how do we as individuals or as consumers play our role um, in becoming storytellers and reclaiming these narratives? Daniel, I wanna to come to you. Talk us through some of the work that you are doing at Zikoko and also the importance of storytelling as a tool for creating empathy for marginalized groups, specifically looking at the LGBTQ community. Thank you so much. Um, just want to warn you that my internet isn't great, so I'm scared I might fall off. So let me try and be as quick as possible. Um, Zikoko is an online publication and we create like beautiful content that's meant to be smart, that's meant to be funny, that's meant to be engaging, that's meant to be honest. Um, but what one of our core principles, and what we tell all the writers that we hire and everyone who works at Zikoko is that what we're trying to do is tell stories that matter. And to us, what that means is letting every voice be heard. There is, um, when we even think about the kind of stories that people tell about Africa, yes, we do think about what, like, white people portray Africa to look like, but there is still a kind of limited view when even Africans are telling their own stories. So for example, in Nigeria, in Nollywood, our film industry, the films that get the most attention are films about the 1%, films about um, wealthy Nigerians just having fun and going to parties and just being happy, but that isn't our reality. Um, and when young, younger filmmakers show films like that or make films like that, they don't get, they're not, they're kind of like, there's a, there's a lot of gatekeeping. So people, um, there's a lot of gatekeeping and so people don't really get to see those stories told, those stories aren't told as frequently. Um, so what we at the Google do is we try to get let everyone speak, we try to hear everyone's voice. We do a lot of um, stories where we interview Nigerians from all around the world, from different backgrounds. Um, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? We can still help, we can still hear you, but it's not clear, but continue. Um, all right, um, yeah, let me, sorry, give me a second. Let me. Um, is it better? It is, it is. All right. So, um, so what we try to do is we get um, Africans from Nigerians from all around the world. We interview Africans and just say, okay, tell us your story regarding this. We have different flagship series, like we have Naira Life, where we talk to people and ask them to engage with us on how they spend money and how money affects their lives. We have Sex Life, where we talk to Nigerians of different gender identities and sexual orientations, talking about what is it like being queer? What is it like being non-binary? What is it like being trans in Nigeria, in Africa? We have love life where we navigate relationships. So for us, it's allowing people to see themselves. I think that is so important. Like representation is, I'm so passionate about representation, especially in film and in media, because I think it saves lives. Since we, since I started Zikoko, a lot of people, <clears throat> instead of working at Zikoko, since we started Sex Life, a lot of people have DM'd me to say, um, thank you, I feel seen. And a lot of queer people I feel seen, I feel represented. I didn't know that there were so many queer people outside just living. When we did our first story interviewing a trans person, a lot of people said they didn't know trans people lived in Nigeria, which is such a crazy concept to me. Of course, there are trans people in Nigeria, but a lot of people didn't realize that. And I think that's the power of storytelling. That's the importance of storytelling. It builds empathy, allows people to see that, to see beyond their realities. And that is one thing that I think Zugoko is very passionate about and very serious about. So for us, um, reclaiming our narratives is about allowing people to speak and not just allowing people that we agree with or allowing people that we relate to, but allowing every single person have their voice heard. I think that's very important. And I think that's what Zugoko is fundamentally about. Yes. Th thanks, Daniel. Um, you, you, I think the key Thing about Zikoko is that your target market is the youth. 
tell me one other thing that that has made Zikoko popular across Nigeria and what makes it such a unique platform. Um, I think what makes it popular is that appeal to, as much as we would love to watch a film that is about something we're familiar with, there's the in like hmm, that people that Daniel, I think pretty vanilla. So it is that intrigue that kind of gets people hooked on Zikoko. So if people really engage with our content because it's different and because it's it's just honest and and so it's it's written in a very simple way. We are not we interview people, just ask them questions. We're not trying to impose our thoughts on them. So we're just allowing people to speak. So it's like having access to every Nigerian's very that's kind of how Zikoko feels. To hear their story and get in and just see all the experiences that I've never experienced but in someone's life outside of mine and not a lot of publications do that so I think that's why people have really gravitated to Zigogo. yes thanks Daniel um audience members please do send in your questions using the Q&A function I will help you take those but before we get to those questions I want to bring in our third and final speaker for today uh Nanjala can you take us through um, the key Swahili language projects that you are doing and how that and your other work speaks to the objective of reclaiming um, our African narratives through storytelling. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so the key Swahili language project is flows organically from work that I've been doing in digital rights and digital um, advocacy. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that because a lot of the technology that we use is built in English speaking communities, primarily in the United States, but also in other parts of the English speaking world. Um, many of us are experiencing technology and translation, and especially from a rights perspective, it can be very difficult when a lot of the things that we're trying to advocate for, the words just don't exist in the language. So, um, for example, things like surveillance. Um, the Kiswahili language doesn't have a word for surveillance, didn't what doesn't um, have a word for surveillance. Um, things like um, digital ID. Um, things like, um, there are so many concepts that it's not just the one-to-one -one translation of the word, but you also want to have people understand what is the import of the word, what is the context in, of the word, and what is it that makes this particular word uh, meaningful. And so having worked in digital rights and, um, advocacy and digital rights research for many years, um, I just came to see, perceive this as a limitation and a challenge in the advocacy work that we're doing. We had gotten to a point where it's a handful of people who are working in English, speaking in English, engaging with each other in English, but um, we're not really translating it. We're not really making the rights real for the people that we're claiming to advocate for. And I'm very driven by this uh, one quote that is was shared by an indigenous Australian woman many years ago, which is, if you have come to save me, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because you realize that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And so the challenge for me was then how can we create a context in which we are working together with the communities that we're claiming to speak on behalf of? Um, we, especially um, during the uh, digital ID campaign in Kenya in 2019, and there's a lot that's been published about this, some of which by me, um, we realized that we needed to not just talk about like IDs because when you say ID, people know what the, we call it Kitambulisho. They know what the ID card is. And so they were like, we don't understand what's the problem. And we have IDs. So they're just putting it on computers. And we're like, no, we have to talk about surveillance and we have to talk about uh, data protection. And we have to talk about, and none of these words exist in Kiswahili. And so um, having experienced that, having tried to be at the forefront of that advocacy campaign is really the immediate impetus for the Kiswahili Language Project. And very briefly, what we're doing is we are creating these words. We've worked with some of the leading scholars of Kiswahili in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, we're working in Kiswahili because Kiswahili is the most widely spoken African language in the world. Um, there are over 300 million speakers of Kiswahili. Um, it is also what, the only African language that is an official language of the African Union. It's, uh, there are plans to have Swahili taught um, in Namibia. There are plans to have it taught in South Africa. So it's a language that is, is 
in, at least here in this region, is approaching that level where um, there's the formal uh, sort of structures that you are able to engage with, but then there's also the spoken language. So there are structures that we can engage with. There are institutes that are promoting the Israeli language. And so we brought those scholars together. We came up with, we spent a lot of time deliberating and talking and back end stuff, came up with the words. And then um, we're also doing uh, in parallel with that a language prize. And a language prize is supposed to encourage people to use the words. It's supposed to take make make them popular, you know, um, and and test them out and see if this is something that can become normalized. And then we're also doing a writing initiative, which is to get people in the human rights and digital rights sector to write about digital rights in Kiswahili. And so we're working with local newspapers and publications um, to try and get opinion pieces and analysis about different aspects of technology published. And so, um, you know, we, uh, myself, I've, uh, like many Africans, uh, grew up in multiple linguistic contexts. And because of that, appreciate that all of us are slightly different in the different languages that we speak. I mean, like I always tell people, I think I'm funnier in Kiswahili than I am in English. Um, I think a lot of us are associate like if your parents switch to you know your mother language it's because they're upset with you and so we kind of have this really negative association um with the mother language which is not fair um but it, it's we we project different aspects of our personalities in the languages that we speak and so this project is a recognition that if we don't find a way of allowing people to fully inhabit the space of technology tell our stories and to advocate for ourselves in the languages that we speak best and in the, the to really represent ourselves and inhabit the technology space. Um, otherwise, we end up in the situation where African societies are spoken about and spoken to, but never spoken with. We're never in dialogue with the people who are building technology. Um, and that's that's basically the theory of change um, behind. We hope that by the end of this project, there's an 18 month project cycle that we have sown enough seeds that other people will feel empowered to be part of the digital rights and tech uh, um, conversation. And that we hope we're building a movement, an organic movement um, for social change in the space. And, and I really ideally, because like, as I said, Kiswahili has formal structures, there are institutes, uh, Bakita, there is uh, the, the ta, Takaki, there is the East African Kiswahili Language Commission. So there are all these formal institutions that we can engage with. But the hope is that if we do this well, because Kiswahili is a Bantu language and it's a Bantu language family is the most widely spoken language family in Africa, that people who speak other African languages will, will have a template for doing that in their own languages. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stop there. That's, that's the, the project and that's the ambition behind it. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Nanjala. I'm like, yes, I'm actually quite excited uh, about hearing about this project. Um, and, uh, and I'm keen to find out, you keep saying, if you do it well, what would stop yeah. you from doing well? What's the hindrance? What, what are the uh, uh, sort of blocks that are blocked that would block you from doing this project very well you know i have to be honest so far every door that we've knocked on has opened so <laughs> that if is really more just out of habit but the the response has been tremendous i mean the language prize i reached out to the mabati cornell uh team who are the the largest kiswahili language prize is the mabati cornell prize so they have the largest pot and um, we, I reached out to them and I said, look, this is what we want to do and expecting there to be like weeks and weeks of deliberation. And it was a three hour email exchange. It's like, yes, absolutely, let's do it. Um, even all of the institutes, because I think there's a recognition that the time is now to do this. I think the only hindrance really is the, it, it is a lot of work. You know, we are, we are working and, you know, we're still doing other stuff. I mean, myself and my project assistant, we're still doing other stuff. Um, we are funded by a grant. Um, I was a recipient of the um, Stanford Digital Civil Society grant, but you know it's a timed um, uh, project. So the funding is an issue. A lot of this, the money now is already like me putting money in. Um, and we're building a game. I should mention, we're also building a game. We're turning the, the, the flashcards into a game. And so it's, it's things like that that would be the hindrance. But 
what I really see happening that's been so exciting for me is that people are really excited about this and the doors have been open and, and have been very generous with their time and with their resources. And so um, the only if is we have to get people to use it. We have to get people to use the words. We have to get people to actually embrace what we're doing. And, and that's the only contingency that we have right now. Wow, thanks, thanks, um, Angela. I want to bring in Daniel and Kiru. Um, uh, uh, Daniel, Sikoko largely focused, but also keeping to the, the, the language um, of, of the work that we do. Daniel, I want to find out um, from Sikoko's perspective, are you guys only publishing in English or other um, Ni original Nigerian languages, if I can put it that way? This is actually a conversation that has been had. Um, the problem right now for us is um, it is a small team. We're still growing. And, but it's a question of, I remember our boss came into the office one day and said, and asked if, like, does the gate man read Zikoko? And so we went, to, we asked him, like, you've been working here. He was like, oh no, he doesn't. Like, cause he doesn't really connect with it that way. And like, so it became a, co a conversation of, yeah, we really should think about expanding in Pigeon and Yoruba. And I think it's one of the reasons BBC is so accessible here in Nigeria because it's BBC House or BBC Evo. Um, but it is a bigger company, but it's definitely a conversation we're going to have. We also were even thinking about like translating it in French for Francophone countries because when we look at like the people that read Zikoko, it's not just Nigerians. A lot of Ghanaians, Kenyans, like people around Africa read Zikoko and and that is even when the Zikoko content is specifically Nigerian. So we can't imagine how people would engage with it if we actually like translated it into different languages. So it's definitely a conversation that we're having and it's something that we would love to do. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Nigel. I just want to quickly go to Kiru. Kiru, what are we doing at a soft power project to be inclusive, to reach those people who do not necessarily speak or understand um, English? Because we all publish in English, mostly. Well, I have to be honest, I sort of like Daniel, we're a pretty small team, we're just starting. And we sort of feel like the world, the world speaks English. And, and so we are also aware that we, we do not aspire to reach every single person because it's an impossibility for us. And what we aspire to do is to sort of amplify the voices, the African, vo African people's voices that should be on a platform when there is um, global conversations being had. So we're not actually trying to reach every single person. What we're trying to do is inspire, like inspire Africans. And so like, if there's an African leader somewhere that you know, can inspire, we want that person, man or woman, girl or boy, to be on a global platform. You know how the world is celebrating, um, um, what's her name, Gre um, um, Greta, the, the climate change? Uh, um, young woman, there's a lot of, you know, amazing young people like her, but they're, you know, Africans, nobody's sort of like bigging them up. We want to big them up. We want the world, we want African kids to see their own version of themselves. When we saw Amanda Gomez on screen, you know, reciting that poem, we were like, whoa, you know, everybody was, all the girls were like, oh my God. When we saw Ngozi Okonjo Iwela with the scarf on as WCO, we were like, oh my God, we can get there. So I think there's room for everybody in terms of what people are trying to do, but our core mission is actually to bring Africans to the global conversation. Nanjala, do you wanna come in there? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that it's very easy to um, underestimate the reach that language can have. So a couple of months ago, uh, in November, I guest edited a special edition of The Continent. And I don't know how many of you have heard of The Continent. It's uh, it's a magazine on, Af it's an African newspaper that's optimized for social media. So for uh, Signal and WhatsApp. So you sign up for free and it lands in your inbox every Saturday. And we had done, I had done an opinion piece in Kiswahili and they had commissioned a bunch of opinion pieces in uh, Shona and Debele. And, um, and we had sort of been testing the idea of language for a number of months. And then we just kind of said, we're going to do a special edition of the continent, which is about the US election. And we're going to do it in as many African languages as we possibly can. And we even stayed away from some of the usual suspects. So we didn't have anything in French. Um, we had 27 writers working in 15 different languages. And it was one of the most popular editions of the magazine. We had Cameroonian pigeon, Nigerian pigeon, Swahili, Portuguese, um, Somali, 
French, Sudanese Arabic, North Sudanese Arabic, South Sudanese Arabic, like we had. And what we did, what really made the difference was instead of thinking about it as a process of translation, we thought about it as a platform for letting people to speak on their own terms. And so we didn't provide any translation for any of the articles. We wanted the people who speak those languages to feel like they were being invited um, as themselves and to speak as themselves. And there was definitely that anxiety of, oh my gosh, is anyone gonna read this? Is anybody gonna understand what we're trying to do? Is it, da, da, da. And it turned out to be completely unfounded because there was enough of the English content that English speakers felt like they could engage with the paper, but there was also everybody would stumble across something that was, you know, in Lingala, in Hirundi, and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm reading this um, in a in a international newspaper. I can't believe, in fact, just today, I still get comments about this paper. Just today, someone was telling me, I've never seen political analysis done in Somali in an international newspaper. So I'm saying that to say that I think we can underestimate the power that our languages have. And I, I recognize, you know, that there is this broader contextual limitation, but um, I look at what Ngugi has done, for example, with his latest book, which is he wrote it in Gikuyu and then he translated it into English. And without caring that the people who read English, like the Kikuyu version existed first. Um, I think if we if we flip that narrative, it's it's if we flip that in ourselves, our intention in ourselves, actually you'd be so surprised at how ready um, people in this continent are to to have their ideas exist in those in their in their languages. Thanks, Angela. I want to move the conversation um, and 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 ask all three of you: um, How do we bring in innovators and those interested in working to reclaim African narratives into the market? I can I can I, I can say something a little bit, and I, I I'll sort of draw. Um, there's a question in the chat from Akosla, who says, um, talking about African voices. What do you think about the work of CNN with projects like African Voices and shaping the African narrative? And I'm going to use that to um, talk to your point, Seppo, about innovators. Um, um, last year, during the core, the peak of um, um, COVID-19, and it was it was it, it's still it's still around. And you know, and we had NSAs in Nigeria, um, which was the movement against um, police brutality. And at that time, um, we, we had Aisha Sase, uh, I don't know, who was a former CNN journalist, cover it. And she sort of reached out to um, us at um, African Women on Board, uh, as well as Bell and Niger, which is like a, this you know, huge life, um, lifestyle um, platform on, 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 in Nigeria and that sort of amplifies the continent. And so um, Aisha Sase was live um, discussing NSAS, we had all of the, you know, the key players from the Femco to um, um, Files, who was one of the leaders in terms of, you know, we had literally a, a plethora of people from the Nigerian Bar Association to literally everyone was on ISSA's platform. But nothing, you know, like it was nice and people turned up, but, you know, it was sort of for me personally, very sad to see that two, three weeks later, when CNN finally came to talk about it, Nigerians and even Africans were saying, oh, thank God for CNN. Oh, thank you for covering it, you know? And we're like, we were here. We were covering Aisha, your own person, your own person, your own sister was covering it way before CNN started covering it. But you didn't say, thank you, Aisha, for doing this. You, you know, until CNN came, you didn't feel like anything had been done. And that's the whole thing around, including making sure we have African voices, leading African stories, because we are, we are here. You know, like the CNN will come for a, a, a second, but the African, the African is African and is living here and is understanding it and is seeing it. And we can sort of like communicate to the world, but we're also sympathetic to who we are. And so we tell the stories differently, but we as Africans also have to actually appreciate Africans who are doing a great job, as opposed to always thinking that the, you know, we will be saved 
by the CNNs and the BBCs and all of that stuff, who, of course, they're also doing a good job. But I also think that CNN, BBC all have to support more African voices to tell their own stories. If that makes so, hopefully that sort of like connects the, um, the dots for you. Thank you. It does. Daniel, do you want to come in there? Sorry, could you please repeat the question? Because I feel like, um, yeah. Just... How do we bring in innovators and those interested in working to reclaim African narratives into the market? Um, well, I think I agree with what Inkeru said, where there is like, uh, there is, there's the habit of assuming that something that isn't done here is just like better, just based on the fact that it wasn't done here. Um, so I do think, just like, and there's also, there's also the issue of people being seen. There are a lot of people doing amazing work, but can people see it? And that's where funding comes in. So you have great content being written, you have great content being created, but it's just in your tiny corner of the world because you don't have money to push it and you don't have money to see it, to see, um, see it in front of people. Um, and that's what's very important about like what um, Inkiru said about these companies that do have hands, hiring important, hiring the people that are on the ground to actually tell these stories or funding people who are telling these stories and like allowing them to be seen. So I think like this, it's just the power of money. People need money to, to be seen. People need money to push the work that they're doing. So, so, that they, so these stories are being told. So like I think innovators will come when they see that there is room. Like when they see other people, like people here are actually telling important stories and people are doing work that matters. That means there is room for me to come. There is room for me to grow this, um, this industry. So I, I definitely think putting, everybody putting their money where their mouth is, is a very big step and allowing people to be seen and allowing people who are doing the work to be heard. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I want to come to the questions um, that we have in, in the question box. And Jenna, I'll start with you. Um, you uh, Anonymous is saying that um, you are saying that funding is not really an obstacle to doing more in getting African narratives out. Um, oh, would... I guess uh, let me move on to sort of Daniel and Kuru, sorry. Um, do you guys concur with Nanjala? In I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that. I said funding wasn't an issue for this project because it was, because it was, I mean, this project is born out of almost 12 years of work. And really, if I, I'm honest about how this Stanford money came together is that I was at a conference. I've, the last year I've been going to a lot of tech conferences and I've been singing this tune from the top of my voice that there's so much more that we wanna do, but we don't have the money to do it. And you say it and you ask and you ask and you ask and then one day someone sees the vision and says, you know what, we want to be a part of that. So funding isn't a problem for this project, but I, I, I would certainly not say that funding is not a problem for African projects. It's a huge problem. It's probably the number one problem, as, as Daniel said. Um, Kiru, Daniel, what would you say uh, sort of the policy or the funding obstacles um, that you've come across in your in your respective projects um okay so i'll i'll say that um from a slightly different perspective um to nanjala but saying the same thing funding is not an issue um it, it may become an issue but uh, i personally from a personal philosophy i feel no pain no gain and so nanjala even though she said funding not an issue for her project she obviously hasn't told you, I mean, she has told you, but she hasn't told you of the hard work she did for 12 years to get to this point where it's no longer an issue. But there was 12 years of toil and pain to get to the point. So I think funding is always going to be some sort of issue, but it shouldn't be an issue to starting something. Because I think if you do great work, the money will follow. If so, that, and that's a thing for Africans, young Africans, I always say, just start, you know, start the thing, keep moving if you do great work like I think it was Will Smith that said you can't outwork me you may be smarter than me you may be whatever it is but you cannot outwork me and literally I don't know anyone who can outwork me so that's what we're doing we're like obviously my poor team we're all sort of like working on killing ourselves but literally we're going with or without funding we want to tell the story we want to amplify African voices we know we have the you know we have the network we have access 
we do a good job, the money will come. That's how we're operating. Danielle, um, how do you, sorry, continue. <laughs> About the funding, I mean, yes, I, yeah, I agree to an extent, but like for like for Zikoko, for example, we want the best teams, we want to hire the best writers, and as much as people who work at Zikoko love Zikoko, I mean, we still got to eat, like, <laughs> we're going to love to write the best stories and interview people, but like, we need to pay salaries, and for example, when we want to, you know, start translating, we're going to need to pay translators, nobody's going to come and work at Zikoko just because they like us, or they think we're doing important work. So as important as it is, we, need, we still need to pay these people. And yes, right now at Zikoko, a lot of our content has, like right now we, we are being read the most than we've ever been read since Zikoko has been created. We have a bigger audience. Our page views are really high, but that's not the cap for us. We want to go higher. And we know that with the way things are set up, like for example, um, we, we publish our stories on Facebook and Twitter. And the way Facebook is now, if you don't promote on Facebook, people are not going to see what you posted because there is a war preventing publishers because Mark wants you to put, use money to push it. So we do need money to push it because we do want more people to see it. There are so many people that have said, oh, reading Sex Life, I realized that my homophobia was stupid. But like some people are never going to see it because we don't have the money to push it in front of more people. And that is for me, that's where funding is. Funding is very important for growth. So we want, there are lots of people that said, immediately I found Jigoko once, I always came back. But there are people that have never seen it. Like in our heads, we think Zikoko is very popular because people are always tweeting about it. But like we know there are so many people that have never seen it. And there are so many people that even if they see it, they won't understand it because of the language it's written in. So there are so many barriers we need to pass. And money, sadly, no matter how good the work is, money is going to help us push those barriers. So yeah, it's, it's very hard. And a lot of people don't want to fund the media because everybody's very focused on tech right now because it feels like we can be very one-track minded in the way we think um, the way we think about the next big industry. So oh yeah, tech is the next thing. So everybody's focused on tech and tech companies are, give, are being given billions, but like just <laughs> throw some millions our way. Let's use it to grow too. But that's, that's not what's happening. So we feel like we're doing our best to work and show that yes, people care about this. This is how the media impacts people. This is how people are invested in it. So if you, if you, if you fund us, we'll be able to do more important work, yeah. Thanks, Daniel. And, and, and I like what Inkiru in, in said that um, when Nanjala started, she had 12 years of grafting, you know, of, the, of going through the hard work. And I want to touch on that. Um, I'm starting out. Where do I start? Um, who do I go to to get funding opportunities um, or guidance on to starting something? Where do, where do we start? What, where, what's the starting point once I've started doing the work? How do I monetize my platform or what, the work that I'm doing? Um, again, I feel like I should say that um, the Kiss Really Language Project is slightly different in that we are not trying to monetize in the traditional sense of the word. Um, I'm not making any money off from this. Um, my, I have a project assistant that I pay, um, but, and we pay people for their time. So like this experts who gave us their time and when people, um, teach you know, the, the workshops that we do, we do pay them for their time. And again, that is the product of this being grant funded. And it's a discrete project that is running for a very discrete amount of time. So unlike what Kiru and, and Daniel are working on, we are not trying to grow as an institution. We're trying to grow as a, as a way of thinking about things, as an idea. And so the funding is really about seeding the ideas and hoping that we create an enabling environment that the ideas will sort of fund themselves. Um, the, probably the only exception to the whole project is the game. And the game, um, it's simple, it's a card game, it's cards. Um, and it's supposed to pay for itself. Um, so that when you buy a pack, you are not just buying that pack, but you're also buying a pack that we're giving to uh, high school students. Um, and so it's slightly different in that way. But in terms of how do I start, where do I start? I will say, I think this is jumping off something that Nikira said or Daniel said, you have to have a clear vision of what it is that you wanna do and why. Because there are going to be very many moments in that 12 year cycle or five year cycle where things, it's not going to make sense to anybody except you. Why are you still doing this? Why don't you go and do something else? Why don't you go, if you're from an African family, go and be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Why are you doing this, taking these risks? And so you have to have to be so clear in what your work is 
And that doesn't mean that when you say the work, we're not talking about your job. We're not talking about your, you know, nine to five or whatever, but what is my contribution to this space that I'm interested in? What can I bring to the table? And to be so clear in that, that even if you say, I'm going to take six months off to go and do this so I can earn some money and bring it back to do this that you will you know that you're coming back because you're so clear in your contribution. I think money um, can be a distraction in the sense that we're told that we have to be profitable within one year, otherwise it's not an initial issue. But I always tell people in the tech space, Uber has never made a profit. Uber has never made a profit in its entire existence. Jumia has never made a profit in its entire existence. There's so many of these big tech companies that have never made money because someone out there, a VC or an angel investor thinks it will make money 20 years down the line. So I wanna be in on that. And that's a two part problem. Um, the other part is that we need people to give money to African initiatives. We need VCs and angel investors to invest in African initiatives, but from the African and innovators part of it, um, Look at the bottom line. Don't be obsessed with the bottom line because money can be a distraction in that way. Look at the bottom line. Don't be obsessed by the bottom line. Love that. Um, I've got a question here from um, Geshi who's curious about some of the big challenges um, that each of you um, have had um, as we advocate for this idea um, that Africans can do it. What's getting in our way? Um, where do we need intervention? Thank you. I'm sure. Um, I, I'm going to sort of piggyback from um, what Nanja was saying. Again, I, I think we, we think very similar, but just a little bit different. Um, I, I, so from our perspective, money is really important. And we are funded, but we're funded by my private sector activity, like, oh, my company's funding Africa for Power. If not, we wouldn't be able to get anywhere. We have to pay for you know websites. We have to pay for marketing. And to um, Daniel's point, to actually be able to create a movement of anything, you actually have to sell it. So there's a lot of marketing. So what we do is we do um, what I call um, Snoop Doggy marketing. So we partner with people. So we had a lot of collaboration. If you don't remember Snoop Doggy, he was always, you know, partnering, collab. One, he's on every music video you think of back in the day, remember? And so we're like, okay, we collaborate with people. We sort of like use their um, space to sort of like um, um, amplify our messaging. So really, really important. But I think a core thing that is, um, a core thing as for me, a very annoying is actually that Africans do not fund Africans. Um, and I think you see it, you know, if you think about African millionaires and all of that stuff, it's a lot harder to get money out of them than if you went to, um, you know, some white bloke in, in Virginia or wherever. And I think that's something that has to change. Um, and then look at it. And if you look deep at most of the Africa initiatives, Africa focused initiatives, they actually are not being run by Africans. They're, you know, they're like usually behind the scene is usually a, um, a non-African who's seen this gap or the opportunity. And then they start this thing. And generally Africans will give money to that. But when you go as an African to say, oh, hey, can we have a meeting? I'd like to talk to you about, you know, soft power or whatever it is, uh -uh, that doesn't happen. It will take me hanging out with Oprah to get, you know, um, my people down this way to take me seriously or take us seriously. So that's one of the things I think we need to change as Africans, we actually need to support uh, um, local African talent. We need to actually support the African dream. We need to actually create the African dream. What is the African dream? It, should, it shouldn't be about the American dream for us. It should be about the African dream. What is it? Whatever language you speak, what is the African dream? Daniel? Okay, yeah, for me, it's a case of, I would say, like, yeah, like, um, like Nanjala said, like, what we're doing is very different. We're a media company, so we do need to be profitable. So when we create content, we're thinking of, yeah, is this sellable or not? Um, but one of the roadblocks we've experienced is that a lot of people are not brave enough to want to push a certain kind of content. Like, like for example, we would have like, okay, Sex Life, we would like to, Sex Life is one of our best performing series in Zikoko history. But people, no company wants to put their name behind it to promote it because it interviews queer people. It doesn't interview just straight people. And for us, that is like, mm, we don't want our company to be associated with this. We don't want, um, for like Love Life, for example, we don't want um, 
a company to be in, like connected with uh, yeah, interviewing a queer couple and for us that is that has been a very big hindrance because what like i i don't believe that um while i'm at, i'm, I'm editor in chief of the google we we'll ever say okay let's stop interviewing diverse people because we want to sell our content that's never going to happen so what needs to happen is that companies need to be braver they need to take a stand during NSAS, that was like for me the clearest the clearest indication of the fact that Nigerian companies like to stand on the line, they like to toe the line. So they'll be like, uh, when I go to tweet answers, we just try to not tweet anything. So so it's so it's not that we're saying anything or we're not doing like it's very I just think we need just the general bigger companies to be braver and like just like put your money where your mouth is like stand for something. The, you're 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 creating value for people and the people they are creating value for are diverse. And not just creating value, you're a bank, and not just creating value for straight people, you're queer people and you're a bank, queer people work for you, like non-binary people, like just <laughs> take a stand. And for me, that's, that has been the biggest issue and that has been the most annoying thing in this journey. So yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. And Tepo, and I want to start a platform like Zigoko, a series like Sex Life. Daniel, how do I begin? What are the building blocks? You said you want to start, like, I didn't hear, you want to start what? I want to start a platform like Zikoko or yeah. a series like Sex Life um, in yeah. my region, in my part of the country or region of the continent. How do I start? Where do I start? Yeah. What are the building blocks? Um, okay, for us, the way it started, we were like, what's something that Nigerians <laughs> um, are kind of obsessed with but don't really talk about? Nigerians were very repressed. So we do, like, Pornhub, would, we release, like, um, a report that says Nigerians watch the largest amount of porn and like when Nigerians don't go out and talk about sex. So we decided to create Sex Life to have those conversations. But one of the things we needed to consider was that this thing cannot have the person's name attached to it because they're not going to be honest if that's the fact. So the first thing we had to agree on is, okay, this has to be anonymous. And immediately we did that, a lot more people like came forward and were ready to share their stories. And I think what people don't realize is that people want to talk. In Nigeria, therapy isn't popular. So there are a lot of people that are repressed and have a lot of things to say, and they don't have the opportunity to say it. And for a lot of people, Zikoko has kind of been that avenue to talk about the things that are bother um, bothering them. So wherever you are, I feel like that's, that translates to everywhere. Everybody wants to share their story. Everybody wants to feel seen. Everyone wants to feel heard. So honestly, if you wanted to start something like Sex Life in say Kenya or Ghana, all you need to do is like literally put out a call and say, okay, I would love to talk to people I love to talk to queer people in Ghana about your experience. Don't worry, your identity is going to be fully protected and you can just tell me anything. You would be shocked about shocked at the amount of people who would reach out because people do want to share, people want to talk. And I don't think it would be as hard as you think it would be. It would be pretty easy to get people. All, all you need is the trust. Like the Zikoko, there is that level of trust because we've been doing this for years and no one has ever come to say Zikoko released my identity or someone found out it was me. And because of that trust, people are very open to sharing their stories. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Ikiru, I want to come to you. As a researcher, um, you, are, you are used to this term um, as, a, as a graduate, uh, Dr. Ikiru. Um, where are the gaps? You, you, soft power project, I see it. Um, what are the gaps? Where are the gaps? How do I contribute and be part of this um, transformation um, conversation? Oh, well, that's a huge question. I, I mean, there is clearly where, where, I mean, I don't even know how to answer it. I can't even, I can't even fake it. Um, <laughs> that's a huge question. I mean, um, I think maybe I would say from a philosophical point of view, as opposed to being able to answer where the gaps are, because I'd rather talk about the things we can do. Um, I think as individuals, uh, um, if we, I, I, I think I, when I was giving my presentation, I talked about my mom saying that if we all swept the front of our yard, we would have a clean street. And I think about the work that Nanjala is doing and uh, uh, the work that Daniel is doing, what you're doing. So imagine if out of a hundred of us, 80 of us were doing our very best in our own spheres. Like, actually, no, 50 of us. No, 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 actually, sorry, I, I, sorry let's go to 20 if we all sort of like aspire to inspire, uh, um, I think that's where, how we can actually move the needle. I, I mean, we, if we're honest, most of our governments haven't done, dealt us, you know, done us well, but as individuals and as the private sector and as non-governmental organizations, there's a lot we could do. 
And there's a lot we could do with even having little money. It's just really about thinking, critical thinking. What I mean, Nigel actually talked about it and like map what you want to do and, you know, create a strategy around it. And, you know, it will come. Because I think of all the things I've done across my life, no one's actually ever thought it was a good idea. But when your instinct says to you, this is a good idea, this is something we should be doing and have a strategy and have a clear strategy and map it from A to Z. This is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end. The middle is usually chaos. You will find that if it's mapped and you have a strategy, it will actually come through. It feels like it wouldn't, but it, it does come through. So I think from a general perspective, I don't know if I've answered your question around challenges because I don't want to start talking about there's a whole bunch of them. I will talk about the things we can do differently and do better to sort of like, you know, raise the standards for everybody else. Thanks, Akira. Angela, I want to start something. Zulu and Guni languages are the biggest languages here in, the, in, in Southern Africa. Um, where do I start building a similar project uh, to the Kiswahili project? Where do I begin? What are the building blocks, the basics? Um, talk to people who are smarter than you. Um, work with people who are smarter than you, who know the language better than you, listen to what they have to say. Um, seek out expertise, seek out experts, bring experts on board. Uh, reach out to people who are passionate, who see the world with the same passion that you do. Work with people who understand why these things matter. Um, start with a, take your big dream and break it down into the smallest constituent parts. And for me, that meant physically mapping it out on an Excel spreadsheet, like, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do that. And it's mapped out for the next um, 18 months. And when I started, everything was coded red. And then when it's in progress, I turned them orange. And then when it's finished, and it started green. And the immense pride that comes from watching those squares start to turn green as you're moving towards your goal. So that is also part of having that vision, uh, putting in the work, reaching out to people who might um, serve your vision, who might work with your vision and pulling in that direction, asking for help. Um, and just internally shifting that idea that our languages can't and starting with the idea that our languages can and what is my place in making that possibility a reality. I think will go a long way. Um, if you are interested in writing in um, languages other than, you know, colonizer languages, um, we have the, the folks, I know the folks of the continent are always happy to receive submissions. And we, through this iteration process, um, have come up with a strategy for editing that makes sure that the stuff that we are receiving is of the same quality as the stuff that we receive in English. So all of which is to say, make a plan, work the plan, um, and you'll be fine. Awesome stuff. Work the plan and make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time. It's one o'clock. Um, and I just want to say I'm fired up. I'm fired up to do better, um, to contribute and uh, continue to grow this conversation um, uh, and support um, all these initiatives and other initiatives that are gonna be on the come up um, as we reclaim our narratives and retell our stories in the way we want to see them. Um, thank you to our panelists for today, Nanjala, Daniel, Kiru, thank you so much for all your insights. Um, I've learned a lot today personally, and I hope you um, have too uh, as audience members. Uh, and without taking too much of your time, um, before we go our separate ways, I'd like to bring your attention to our next Jamlab meetup. The third of a four part, as I said, um, the third one coming on coming up on the 27th of May. Uh, this next session will be looking at um, elections in Africa. Really, we want to look um, at how the civic tech and journalism community can prepare um, for the elections, but this time they're different. They're happening during a pandemic. Um, so please do join us. Um, the registration link for this session is in the chat right now. Do click on it, but we'll also share it on our social platforms and on our, our, our website, civictech.africa, as well as jamlab.africa, to continue this conversation um, on elections. But let's not, that, let's not limit that conversation to just these meetups. Please feel free to reach out, chat to us, email us if you have any ideas on how we can collaborate and drive actual impact 
um, through our different platforms and various channels. Let's not make this just a talk shop. Let's do something uh, about the ideas that we are coming out with uh, from these conversations. Uh, the details are on your screen on how you can reach us. Uh, from myself, Tafa Chavalala, the Jam Lab team and the Civic Tech Africa team, thank you for joining us and we will see you at the next Jam Lab meetup.